Our Father and our God, as we come to your word today, we come with humble and open hearts, hearts that long to hear from you, hearts that need to hear from you. Your word, Father, gives life. The, the one who meditates on your law day and night is like a tree planted by streams of water, uh, whose leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Father, we want that to be true of us. So may we meditate upon your word today. May we receive your word. May you declare to us the truth that you want us to hear. And Father, I pray that we would realize the great privilege that we have in prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may remember a little over a year ago that we had a man and his wife join us, Dr. Glenn Sunshine. He joined us for worship last year, and then the evening time, he shared at the evening service, and he talked about uh, the great work that Jesus is doing globally with the spread of the gospel and the building of the church. Well, I was listening to a podcast that Glenn Sunshine was on a couple months ago, and he was asked the question, as you look at our nation around us, you look at the rebellion and the hard-heartedness, the opposition to God, then you look at the church and you see the weakness impotence, the cowardice that there is in a lot of the church, this, this uh, interviewer said, there is a remnant of believers that want to learn to fight the good fight and engage the battle. What, Dr. Sunshine, would you say to them? And here's what he said. The first thing that we have to remember is that the battle is fundamentally spiritual. And what that means is that we need to use our primary spiritual weapons in the battle. And I would say that that really begins with prayer. The fact is that if you go to places where Christianity is exploding, these people spend time in prayer that is staggering compared to what Americans do. It's no wonder that the Holy Spirit is working there. When you look at their commitment to prayer, their utter dependence and reliance upon prayer, that's where it's got to begin. If we're not doing that, we might as well as not engage at all. I think Dr. Sunshine is exactly right. As you look at the American church, by and large, the American church is not characterized as a praying church. We need to realize that the battle that we're in right now is a spiritual battle, and we need to take up the spiritual weapons that Jesus has given us, and that begins with prayer. So the primary passage we're looking at today is James 4, verse 2. And in that passage, James says, you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. There are blessings and graces and gifts that you don't have simply because you don't humble yourself to God and ask. There is a want, a lack of conformity into the image of Christ because you don't ask. There is not a courage to stand on the word of God because we don't ask. There is not men who lead the church with hearts that are filled with the Holy Spirit because we don't ask. There's not a boldness in evangelism because we don't ask. What a horrible thing to be said of us that we don't have simply because we don't go to our Father in prayer and ask Him. Now, for some of you, this rebuke from James, it hits you directly between the eyes because as you look at your life, you're not a man or woman that's devoted to prayer. There's a lack of prayer in your life and it's, it's eminently true. You don't have because you don't ask. And my hope is that this message would strengthen your faith so that you go to your Father in heaven in prayer. But I praise God that for many of you, I know that you are a people devoted to prayer. Um, I, I praise God for you as a church. There's many things that I praise God for you for, but one of those things is that for many of you, you are a people that are devoted to prayer. I know that you spend time fasting and praying. I know that you spend time praying as a couple or with your children. I know that you're devoted to prayer on Wednesday nights with the church for the prayer meeting. I know that you love to pray, and I praise God for that. And so my prayer for you, as you're hearing this message, is like what Paul says in Philippians 1, that you would continue and you would abound more and more, that you'd keep at it, that you'd increase in what you're doing. Now, one thing that can trip us up in prayer is a warped view of the sovereignty of God. It's a warped view of the sovereignty of God. The Bible is very clear that God is absolutely sovereign over all things. In Ephesians 1.11, it says that God works out all things according to the counsel of his will. God's sovereign over absolutely 
every single thing, and he's working out every single thing according to the counsel of his will. But for many of us, we have a hard time reconciling that with our passage. You do not have because you do not ask. How can both those things be true? If God is sovereign over absolutely everything, he has ordained everything, he's working out all things according to the counsel of his will, and how can it be that we do not have because we do not ask? We might say, if God has ordained all things and is working out all things, then won't his plan come about regardless of whether or not I pray? I think for many of us, we view God's sovereignty like a thicket in the path of prayer. It trips us up in prayer. But the sovereignty of God in reality is like a rocket launching pad. It's the one thing, it's the fundamental thing that launches us off in faith in prayer to God. Sovereignty of God is not an impediment to prayer. It is a a fuel for prayer. And this is how it was for the early church. If you look at the early church in Acts 4, when they were starting to receive persecution, they cried out to God and they said, O sovereign Lord, you're sovereign over the threats that we're receiving right now. You're sovereign over the persecution that's coming our way. And then the thing that they prayed for was make us bold. Help us to keep proclaiming the gospel. So notice the connection there. They're declaring the sovereignty of God, God's sovereign over absolutely everything, and they're earnestly crying out to God, God, help us to be bold. Help us not cower in fear. Because God is sovereign, they prayed earnestly. And if you understand the sovereignty of God, it's going to launch you to pray earnestly for your faith, for your family, for our church family here, and for the advance of God's kingdom. So what I want to do today is I want to look at three different truths. First is the the total sovereignty of God. Then I want to look at the power of prayer. And then I want to look at why has God ordained, our sovereign God ordained, that he works through prayer. I think taking these three truths together, this should be an encouragement to all of us to be devoted to prayer. All right, so first, the total sovereignty of God. But what does it mean for God to be sovereign? I think this is in your sermon notes there. Here's a a definition from a theologian, Bruce Ware. I think this is a good starting point. He says, For God to be sovereign means that he exhaustively plans and meticulously carries out his perfect will as he alone knows is best. Regarding all that is in heaven and on earth, and he does so without failure or defeat, accomplishing his purposes in all of creation, from the smallest details to the grand purposes of his plan for the whole of the created order. So notice two parts here. First, God exhaustively plans. This speaks to his eternal decrees. God doesn't just have a general decree for what will happen and then leave the details to chance. God thoroughly ordains all things of every person and every single thing And that will certainly come to pass. Turn to Isaiah 37, verse 26. Isaiah 37, 26. This is God speaking of uh, the evil king Sennacherib, who has surrounded Jerusalem at this time. King Hezekiah is the king. And this is what God says of this mighty, powerful king of Assyria. Verse 26. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruin. So notice that God says here that he, his plans, his sovereign plans are over this mighty king. The mighty king's not sovereign. God's the one that's sovereign over him. And he determined it long ago regarding Sennacherib that he, that he meaning Sennacherib, should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins. God's the one ordained that this evil king, this mighty king, would be someone who brings devastation upon other empires. He would conquer other empires. That's not something Akram's doing, ultimately. That's God's doing. He declared it from long ago. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 4. This is God's eternal decrees for us as believers. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 says, 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So Paul says here that Christians, we as Christians, we've been chosen by God to be holy and blameless. And God didn't choose us based upon our foreseen goodness. He didn't see good in us and then he chose us. We know that because it says here that he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Before we were even on the horizon, before we had even arrived. Uh, far be before that, God chose us in Christ that we should be holy and blameless in him. What this means is that we are saved according to the sovereign decree of Almighty God. God chose us in Christ. And then look down at verses 9 and 10. It says, Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. What we see here in this passage is that God's eternal decree, it has a purpose. It's not, uh, it's not aimless, it's not random, it has a purpose. And that purpose is to unite all things in him, that is, in Christ. What that means is that God's ordained that all things are going to be put under the feet of Christ. All enemies are going to be put under the feet of Christ. It's all going to be united in Christ at the very end. Cancer is going to be put under the feet of Christ. Demons, hurricanes, our sexuality, our battle with sin, absolutely everything is going to be united in Christ. That's God's eternal decree. So we see that God's eternal decree is over absolutely everything. Powerful kings, the salvation of, uh, of us as believers, and all things will be united in Christ. So that's God's eternal decree. The other point that Bruce Ware brought up is he meticulously carries out his perfect will. And that speaks to God's providence. So his eternal decree and his providence. Now, there's, there's some Christians that believe that God has a, a comprehensive plan, but in an effort to secure real human freedom, that he providentially is not involved in every specific detail of every event in our lives. Rather, he responds to our choices and actions as they come about, and he does so in a way that accomplishes his purpose. But is that, is that what we see in Scripture? That God's not providentially over absolutely everything, but he's simply responding to us as human beings. Well, no, what we see is God, God's providence is over absolutely everything. Let me list a handful of things. First, his preservation of all things. Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is the eternal word in him. All things were made, but when he made all things, it's not just wound up and just continues. Jesus, by the word of his power, is upholding the universe. Absolutely everything he's upholding by the power of his spoken word. Inanimate creation is upheld by God. Job 38. Have you entered the storehouses of snow? Have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? So God has storehouses of snow. He has storehouses of hail. And the Lord willing, in a few months from now, we're going to receive some of those storehouses of snow here in Vermont. God, God works through the tilt of the earth. God works through the evaporation of the Pacific Ocean and and all that condensation coming our way. God works through all that. But God is the ultimate cause in all of that. He's the one that designed the earth the way it is. He's the one that, that uh, carries about all that precipitation from thousands of miles away and then dumps it here. God's the one that has the storehouses of snow. Random events are governed by our God. Proverbs 16.33, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The lot is similar to... What we have is dice. The lot is cast into the lap. But every uh, turning of that dice, every, every time it comes up to whatever it is, that decision is from the Lord. Which means when you play Yahtzee or something like that, God knows exactly what's going to happen every single roll. Every decision is from the Lord. Animals are under the providence of God. Psalm 104. Uh, animals all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. 
When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. God's sovereign over feeding animals. God's sovereign when they don't have food. God's sovereign when they die. He's in control of all of that. Nations. He's sovereign over nations. Job 12, 23. He makes nations great, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations, and he leads them away. He's the one that brings up nations. He's the one that brings down nations. And think of all the things that are involved in the exalting of nations and in the destroying of nations. For exalting of nations, you need a population to greatly increase. The economy booms. Rulers govern with wisdom and justice. And many more things. When a nation is destroyed, the people become corrupt. Nations are brought against them. Oftentimes there's natural disasters. The economy collapses and so on. And God's sovereign over all those things that lead to the exaltation of a nation and to the destruction of a nation. And finally, God is sovereign. He's working out his plan even over evil. Even over evil actions and evil thoughts and evil intentions of man. A couple examples. Uh, in 1 Samuel 2.25, it says, Eli's wicked sons would not listen to Eli's godly rebuke, quote, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Eli's sons were, were wicked men, and Eli rebuked them, said, this is not right what you're doing. But they would not listen, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. God was sovereign over Eli's son's hard-heartedness. You think of how God intended the evil actions of Joseph's brothers for good in Genesis 50, verse 20. Or how God hardened Pharaoh's heart, we see in Exodus 4, 21. Or the greatest act of evil, how God was sovereign over Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Jewish leaders in the crucifixion of the Son of God. It says in Acts 4, 28, they did whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So brothers and sisters, what we see from Scripture is God has eternally planned all things. God, uh, God's providence exists over absolutely everything. God is sovereign even over evil, but in a way in which he is not tempting anyone to sin, as we see in James 1.13, and mankind is always responsible for the evil committed because they're acting according to their own evil nature. Now there's a lot of mystery here, but this is the testimony of God's word. So what we see is that God's sovereignty is exhaustive and it's meticulous over all things. Nothing can thwart or frustrate the, so the sovereignty of God. God always accomplishes what he intends. So that's the first point is God's sovereignty over everything. But the second point is there's great power in prayer. There's great power in prayer. Now, of course, the power in prayer is found in our God who answers our prayers but we shouldn't hesitate about speaking of the power of prayer because Scripture speaks that way. One of the passages that, uh, that Claude read, James 5.16, says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. So prayer has great power. Godly prayer changes things. God truly does hear and answer our requests. Turn to uh, Philippians 1.19. Philippians 1.19, Paul's in prison here, and he's confident that this is going to result in his deliverance. And listen to the reason why he can have this confidence. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul, Paul is confident as he's in prison. This is going to result in my deliverance. Why? In part, through your prayers. Through your prayers, God will move. In Isaiah 37, I, I mentioned Sennacherib and how he had surrounded uh, Jerusalem. And uh, King Hezekiah, uh, there was no hope that, no human hope that he had at all. Uh, this is a mighty, powerful Assyrian army. And so what Hezekiah did, he's a godly king, he cried out to God. He said, God, please hear my prayer. Save us, deliver us, rescue us. After, Isaiah, after Hezekiah prayed, Isaiah the prophet was sent to Hezekiah, and he said, because you have prayed, this is what God says, Isaiah was giving the report from God, 
Because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. Notice, because you pray, here's the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is, God will deliver you. And we read that very night that the Lord struck down 185,000 Assyrians. And Hezekiah and Judah was saved. Hezekiah prays to God at this impossible situation, and God brings deliverance. God works mightily through prayer. And what we see throughout Scripture is the prayer of a godly person does have great power. Let me list a handful of examples here. By the prayer of Moses, God brought the plagues upon Egypt and then removed them again. By prayer, Joshua made the sun stand still. By prayer, when Samson was ready to perish with thirst, God brought water out of the hollow place for his sustenance. By prayer, the strength of Samson was restored. He pulled down the temple of Dagon on the Philistines and upon his death. By prayer, Elijah held back the rains for three and a half years. And then again by prayer, God brought the rains. By prayer, Elijah called down fire from heaven upon the sacrifice, showing that Yahweh was the one true God. By prayer, Hezekiah was healed from his deadly disease and given 15 extra years of life. By prayer, Abraham received a son at the age of 100 years old. By prayer, Moses received help at the Red Sea, and the Red Sea was parted. And by prayer, the Israelites were delivered from Egypt. Brothers and sisters, let us not doubt that prayer has great power. In fact, things happen in prayer that would not otherwise happen if we did not pray. Let me repeat that. In prayer, things, uh, things happen in prayer that would not happen otherwise if we did not pray. Again, go to our passage. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. This passage does not say that we do not have because it's not God's will for you to have. Although, of course, that's true. What it says is we do not have simply because we don't ask. Which one implication here is there are things that we would have if we would ask. All we have to do is ask. Now let me just have a couple points of clarification here. First, this does not mean that we can ask for selfish or self-centered things and expect that we'll receive from God. Because right after this, in James 4, in the very next passage, it says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Having self-centered, uh, self-focused, ignoring the glory of God and God's purposes, that kind of prayer, we shouldn't expect that God will answer that. Prayer has to be centered on the will of God and the purposes of God. This also <clears throat> does not nullify the sovereignty of God. For James to say, you do not have because you do not ask. That doesn't nullify the sovereignty of God. God could accomplish all things without prayer. He could accomplish all things without prayer. But he's ordained that he will accomplish some things through our prayers. Prayer, it's not an absolute necessity to bring about God's plan. God could bring it about. He's not, he doesn't have to be dependent upon prayer. But prayer is a contingent necessity because he's ordained to accomplish it through prayer. For example, Hezekiah, he couldn't have said, well, it's God's will that we're going to be delivered from the Assyrians here, from this great army. Therefore, I don't need to pray. God would say to him, no, Hezekiah, I've ordained that I'll bring salvation and deliverance through the prayers of my people. So because I've ordained that, then go to me in confidence in prayer. What this means is that through prayer, we are participating in God's ordained work. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says that we are fellow workers with God. Think about that. You're a fellow worker with God. This is true in all that we're called to do, but it's certainly true in regards to prayer. You're a fellow worker with God. Though God is sovereign and could, of course, accomplish everything unilaterally, without us at all, he enlists you and I to join him in his sovereign work. God is pleased to work through your prayers. So God is absolutely sovereign. Prayer has great power, 
And the final point I want to look at is, well, why has God ordained it this way, that he works through our humble, small prayers? Let me mention three reasons. First, prayer deepens our relationship with God. It deepens our relationship with God. It does this in a lot of ways, but let me mention two. One is, as we devote ourselves to prayer, we are acknowledging our own need of God. When we're going to God in prayer, we're acknowledging our need to God that, that we can't do it, that we don't have the resources, that we desperately need help from God. And so when you cry out to God in prayer, when you're crying out to God to forgive your sins, to give you wisdom, to give you power to kill sin, you are demonstrating your dependence on God. God doesn't need or benefit from your prayers in any sense, but he does delight in seeing how much you acknowledge that you need him. We are, we are children who desperately need our Heavenly Father for help in everything. That's one way in which it deepens our relationship with God. We're acknowledging our own neediness of God. But another way is, through prayer, we're seeing the great goodness of God towards us as well. In uh, Matthew 7, 11, it says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? When, when God answers our prayers, what he is revealing to us is his abundant goodness to us, his children. How kind of God to forgive your besetting sin when you come to him in confession. The fifth time, the tenth time, the twentieth time, the one hundredth time that you've brought that, that sin before God and he forgives you again and again. Don't we see the goodness of God in that? How kind of God to heal your child or your spouse from the stomach bug or the common cold. How kind of God to restore your marriage. How kind of God to make us a church that's filled with his spirit. Prayer builds our relationship with God by revealing our great need and God's great goodness. So that's one reason why God has ordained prayer this way. A second reason is prayer increases our thanksgiving to God. It increases our thanksgiving to God. And go to uh, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 11. Here the Apostle Paul says, You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. He's talking to the Corinthian church and he says, You must help us by prayer. You must help us by prayer. And the aim of this is that there will be thanksgiving so that many will give thanks for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So as we're bringing up our prayers to God and we're crying out to him for whatever that petition might be, as we see God answering our prayers, we see the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, and the response of that should be is that we then are thankful to God for hearing our prayers. Think of what would happen if, if God didn't work through prayer at all, if God just worked unilaterally. If that was the case, then how much of what God does would we not notice? We just wouldn't notice it because we're not, we're not burdened in prayer for it. How little would we respond in praise if that was the case? But because we're fellow workers with God in prayer, as we pray, we, we grow more desperate for God. We grow more fully aware of what he's doing. We're drawn into his plan and into his work. And then when he does answer, we see it as a work of God, and we give him all the praise and all the glory. I'm sure you can think back in your life on how you've been praying for something, bring before God, and then finally God answers, and he answers perfectly in his perfect timing, and your response is, God, you're so good. One, one example that came to my mind as I was preparing this message was about seven years ago when I was a pastoral assistant at Crossway Church, we had planned this huge neighborhood outreach of caroling. Uh, to the neighborhood, and we had put together 100 gift baskets uh, with a number of gifts and with gospel tracts in them and information about our church, and then we were going to go to 100 houses as a church family and sing carols to them and give a gift. If I remember correctly, the, the day that we planned for the caroling was the Sunday before Christmas, 
And as that day approached, the forecast was 100% chance of rain. 100% chance of rain. Well, you, you can't go caroling in 100% chance of rain. It's just not going to work. And so I remember praying earnestly, God, please uh, give good weather. It's going to be really hard for us to get together again later on in the week. This is the final Sunday before, before Christmas. So I was praying, and I believe praying with Ashley as well. And wouldn't you know, it was raining all through church that morning. And then we ate together uh, a lunch after church, still raining then. And then we, we debriefed regarding the caroling. We got outside, and it was clear for that two or three hours that we were caroling. And it was so obvious, our good God answered that pretty small request. And he is so good. He is so good. So prayer increases our thanksgiving to God. And then finally, petitionary prayer, it sanctifies us as we persevere in prayer. It's a means of grace for us. Often, God's not going to answer our prayers for a long, long time. And sometimes, he says no. Sometimes, he says no. In part, because he wants us to come to a greater appreciation of his sustaining grace. And this was the case for Paul and his thorn in the flesh. Remember in 2 Corinthians, Paul's thorn in the flesh, this affliction, we don't know exactly what it was. But Paul says that not once, not twice, but three times he pleaded with God that he would remove this thorn in the flesh. And it wasn't until the third time that he prayed that God then answered and he said, No, because my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. So notice, because Paul persisted in prayer, he came to know an aspect of God's grace and power that he otherwise would not have known. God designs you to persevere in prayer because he wants you to grow in holiness. God wants you to know his comfort in affliction. He wants you to grow in hope for Christ's return. He wants you to experience peace when he says no. So God has designed prayer as a means of grace for your sanctification. So brothers and sisters, we are in a spiritual battle, and we must remember that one of the primary weapons that God has given us is prayer. And this is the fruit of the gospel, isn't it? Jesus sent, uh, God sent Jesus, his beloved son, that we who are far off can be brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we now have confidence through the blood of our Savior to approach the throne of grace with boldness because of the work of our Savior. So pick up your weapon and devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to private prayer. Devote yourself to private prayer. Make time every single day to devote yourself to prayer. It doesn't have to be long. It could be three minutes or maybe five minutes, but devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to family prayer. Devote yourself to family prayer. Prayer with your spouse, prayer with your kids. And brothers, take the lead in this. Take the lead in this. God calls us in Ephesians 5 to, to wash our wives uh, with the ministry of the word. And certainly that includes prayer as well. Leading in prayer with our with our spouse. After dinner or before you go to bed, just ask your wife, honey, can we pray together? And lead in prayer. Now, you might say, well, I haven't been doing this. This will be really awkward if I do this. Um, how, what, what motivation could I have to do this? What if I don't really know how to pray? Well, Stonewall Jackson, he was a, a general in the Civil War, and he attended church prayer meetings and uh, after his pastor had taught the congregation on the duty of public prayer, Jackson told his minister, he said, uh, you are my pastor and the spiritual guide of the church. If you think it's my duty, then I shall waive my reluctance. He was uh, not good at public speaking at all. I'll waive my reluctance and I'll make the effort to lead in prayer, however painful. Well, soon afterwards, the minister called upon Jackson to pray at one of these prayer meetings, and it was painful. He stammered through his prayer, uh, everyone was embarrassed, and he writes that it was almost as painful to his brethren as it was obviously to himself. Well, the minister wanted to spare Jackson from further embarrassment, embarrassment, and so the minister did not call him to pray publicly over several weeks. And when he told Jackson that he wanted to spare him an uncomfortable duty, Jackson said, yes, but my comfort or discomfort is not the question. If it is my duty to lead my brethren in prayer, then I must persevere in it until I learn to do it aright 
and I wish that you would disregard my feelings in this matter. Amen? So, brothers, I say this in love, your feelings don't matter. God calls you to lead in prayer, and it doesn't matter how awkward it is, just go for it. And God will be pleased through it. And then finally, let's keep devoting ourselves to corporate prayer as well. Keep devoting ourselves to corporate prayer as well. On Wednesday nights, at the men's gatherings that we have, at the women's Bible studies that we have, let's make sure that we're keeping that a priority, that we are gathering together as a church and devoting ourselves to prayer. Our God works through prayer. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, I pray that you would work within our own hearts to give us faith, to trust in you, and to go to you regularly in prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us to realize the great privilege that we have in prayer, the honor, the blessing, the right that we have in Christ. And Father, I pray that we would be a church family that is devoted to prayer. And as we do that, I pray that you'd be pleased to receive our prayers and that you would work mightily in our midst. We thank you, and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.